Good morning. So they've actually done some studies about relationships in um, in Alameda County in California. They did a nine-year study studying what happens when people are involved in relationships and when they're not. And what they discovered is that isolated people are three times more likely to die than relationally connected people. And even if you are overweight, eat poorly, and don't exercise, if you are connected with friends, you will outlive people who have good eating habits, exercise habits, but are isolated. So yes, it has now been proven that cupcakes with friends is better than cauliflower all by yourself. <laughs> It's true. And that's not all. The American Medical Association, the journal, posted a study where 276 volunteers uh, allowed themselves to be infected with a virus that produced the common cold, and they wanted to see how people were affected who were in relationship and people who were not in relationship. And people with better relationships did four times better fighting off illness than those who were isolated. They were less susceptible to colds. They shed less virus, and I'm not making this up, they actually produced less mucus than isolated people which means we have scientific evidence now that unfriendly people are actually literally snottier than, <laughs> than friendly people. <laughs> oh. I should just end right there because like, that's enough information for us today. Why do I bring it up? Because last week we talked about how God created the world. Today we're going to talk about how he created the church. There's a lot that was lost when Adam and Eve failed and fell. And what we see is God redeeming, recovering, and restoring what was lost in that first fall. And we find it in Acts, the second chapter. Uh, it says they devoted the, this new community of believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So last week we looked at what God intended for us. He, he intended for us to be in relationship with him and with others. And he intended for us to exercise authority that we would not simply be the byproduct of whatever forces were coming upon us or opposed to us. And that we would actually be fruitful. We would take the good things that he has provided and even make them better. And after the terrible fall of Adam and Eve, when they fractured and broke their relationship with God, it also fractured and broke relationships with each other. Immediately, they began to blame each other. Their own children got into a situation where one son killed another. The first children born in this world actually wound up in a death battle. You can see how embedded this brokenness is into our lives. And God didn't abandon humanity because of this. He, he didn't walk away from it and say, well, I'll, I'll do something else someplace else. He began a redemption, restoration, recovery mission. And he did that by sending his son to pay the price for all of our brokenness and to recover and restore what he had originally intended. So the followers of Jesus had been, who had followed Jesus, and he's now told them, you need to go to Jerusalem and wait, and I'm going to send you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this gift of the Holy Spirit is going to restore authority to your life, which enables all these other things to flow. Freedom in what Christ has done, authority in what the Holy Spirit gives. And then you'll be able to take advantage of the opportunities that the Holy Spirit provides for you. So it says that they devoted themselves to some things. That's really intriguing. Because the word devoted, it means a couple of things. It means to concentrate on and commit to. Right? 
Uh, some of you have devoted yourself to getting in shape this year. And we're 13 days into the new year, so how are you doing? And uh, um, some of us devoted ourselves to eat a little bit better. And, and some of us will take that seriously and some of us not so seriously. They devoted themselves, it says, to the apostles' teaching. So that's interesting. They were listening. They, they concentrated on and committed to ongoing learning. But for the early church, that was not enough. They also devoted themselves to the fellowship, to the community. They concentrated on the community. They committed themselves to the community and to breaking of bread, just getting together and, and eating. And they devoted themselves to prayer. That, that for them, doing what we're doing right this moment was not enough that listening to a teaching from Scripture that would help us understand God, ourselves, and our world a little bit better was good, and they did concentrate on and commit themselves to that. But for them, that was an inadequate. They couldn't really accomplish what Christ intended if that's all they did. So here's what I want you to see. There are some things you will not learn about God apart from community. I'm not saying it's harder to learn these things about God. It's actually not possible to learn them about God. We need to be engaged in community. Uh, a lot of us believe, we've, we've kind of accepted a cultural concept about this, that if you hear a thing and you remember a thing, you know a thing. And it's simply not true. Our capacity to hear and recall is not the same thing as knowing. But when people who hear a thing and they can recall a thing get together and they have conversations about it, they have questions that they don't understand. They have insights that they want to share. They have challenges that, that they have to kind of find a solution to in their thinking because seem, things seem to be in conflict. That through that process, you actually get to know a thing. This is a really imp important because in much of the Western world, we just assume as long as you can recall portions of Scripture, you know God and what those early believers were committed to was not just to, to hearing the lessons, but to getting together and having these conversations about it. So when humans broke their relationship with God, uh, it devastated their relationships with each other, but now relationships are being restored, and God is using this new community of faith in order to do that. And what's fascinating is who got included in this community. Like, right now, there's all kinds of organizations and clubs and groups and Facebook pages that are based on affinity. Everyone likes the same thing. And uh, what we've discovered around here in, in our church, I know you're surprised by this as I am, but not everybody at Calvary Assembly is a Buffalo Bills fan. <laughs> I, I saw a person, they came into membership class yesterday wearing a Pittsburgh Steelers shirt. You know... <laughs> oh, how quickly, how quickly it can turn. And, and like, I, I, I watched a few minutes of a couple of playoff games yesterday, and the Bills were not there. <laughs> Again, it's, it's like we're never there. And, and even on staff, I know you're surprised. But even on staff, you think we would have vetted for that when we hired, but <laughs> we didn't. It didn't come up. Our world tends to connect based on affinity. One of the great challenges is we can walk into a room like this, scan it quickly, and if we don't see anybody that looks like us, we assume we're not welcome. And so we don't understand that some of our best connections and relationships can actually be established with people who are remarkably different from us. And I've done a lot of premarital and marriage counseling over the years, and I can tell you it's a true thing. Opposites attract. And yet, when it comes to being in community, we tend to gravitate to those groups that seem easier for us because we already like the same things and think the same things. And that first church wasn't like this at all. That first church, it grew and became a group that, that there, there were male and female. In, in the ancient world, you can't appreciate how how radically different that was. And then there was Jew and Gentile. That just wasn't uh, done. And there were bond and free. I mean, it's just unbelievable. In fact, in Antioch, 
That's the first place that they called these followers of Jesus Christians because for the first time in human history, your religion couldn't be identified by your ethnicity. The Romans always followed the Roman gods. The Greek always followed the Greek gods. The Jews always followed the Jewish god. And for the first time in human history, you couldn't identify your religion by ethnicity, and so they called them Christians. That people came together not because they all liked the same things or they all ate the same things or because they all looked alike or they all thought alike. They came together because they, they were exposed to the grace of God and that was the attraction. That's a really powerful thing. So, so we, we're called to create this kind of community. And what's really cool is not only are we called to it, we're kind of we're built for it. It's a natural instinct. It's an amazing thing to me, all right? If you go out and you have a really, really, really astonishing good meal at a restaurant, you want to tell someone about it. I mean, I swear, half the pictures on Facebook are food. <laughs> the other half are cats, which I completely do not understand, but... <laughs> I won't go there, so... <laughs> I'm, I'm censoring as I talk. <laughs> and sometimes we'll want to take someone there to eat it with us, or we'll tell other people about it. If we read a really good book, we want to share it. If we, if we watch a really good movie, we, we want other people to know about it. You know, we're binging on this Netflix show, and we want everybody to know it. Why do we do that? Why do we bother to tell somebody else? Why can't we just enjoy it? It's because you're created for community. They've actually done studies on this, too. If you are watching a funny movie by yourself, you will laugh less than if you are with people. You will laugh louder and longer when there are people around you. It's just, it's an intriguing thing. We are created for this. And we're called for this. And so the church began to realize that there's more than just the things that we agree on and like and already have in common. That there's this incredible thing that God wants to do in our lives and that we can share this with each other. Now, our culture has basically told us that a truly free person is a person who doesn't need anybody else. You can just stand all by yourself, and because you have the capacity and the courage to do that, then you are truly free. And so we try it, and in our attempt to be isolated, because we assume that means freedom. We have to medicate ourselves into oblivion because it's not working. Freedom is not about isolation. So we need to pursue things that, that, that help us build community. Now, in our world, people tend to pursue things that they think will bring friends to them. For example, it is not uncommon for people to want to acquire more wealth, resources, things, because then other people will want to be around them. People want to become powerful, influential uh, leaders of things because other people will want to be around them. People want to succeed, to win, uh, to, 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 um, to be victorious in some sport or something because other people will want to be around them. And it's true. If you have a lot of money or a lot of power or you are good at a sport, there are people who will be around you. But there always comes a day when you lose some money, or you lose your title, or you lose the game, and that's when the greatest fear of all comes, is they were really only here for what I had, not for me. And so Jesus says that valuing those things actually only creates a kind of bondage. That when, when we when we focus on having more or doing more or doing better than someone else, it's true, people will want to be around us, but if somebody else does better, they'll go with them, or if we fail, they'll leave us. And we struggle with that. We know that's not a good thing. And so Jesus insists that there's a different set of attractional values in community, and it's completely countercultural. Like every one of these words I'm going to talk about today is, is, is going to strike fear into us. For example, the fr uh, well, there's a point to make before I get to the three words. Uh, there are some things, no, there we go. My remote is dying. <laughs> I, you do know I, every guy has to have a remote. That's 
how it works. True communi community values vulnerability. This is how Jesus would say it. I am sending you out like sheep among <laughs> wolves. Who does that? Who wants that? Right? Why don't you send us out like wolves among sheep? That's better. Give us sharp teeth and fangs. Give us sharp claws. Make us big and bold and muscular and send us out just to devour anything that doesn't accept us. And there are whole religious systems that try to build themselves on that. And Jesus says, you're going to go out like sheep among wolves. Not a ninja sheep. <laughs> Not a sheep that poses a martial arts position and looks at the wolf and goes, no, 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 that, not that kind of sheep. How does a sheep act among wolves? Yeah. Carefully. Like if the wolf is sleeping, does the, does the sheep go, bah! No, the wolf is going to be very, very quiet, or the sheep is going to be very, very quiet. This is what Jesus says, that when you recognize you are a sheep. When you act like a sheep, that it actually opens more doors for you in our world than when you act like a wolf. Because when people see the wolf coming, what do they do? They close the door. And yet our whole world is, is, establishes a doctrine about how you can be a bigger and better wolf. And Jesus says, not how it works. You actually have to learn how to be vulnerable. This is absolutely unbelievable because vulnerability means that I'm willing to be honest about the stuff that I would rather hide. That the church, the church would practice this. Believe it or not, when they got together, they wouldn't just talk about the stuff that went really well for them, the deal they closed and the profit they made and the lesson they learned and, and, and the mate that they attracted or the brilliance of their child or grandchildren. They shared all those things, but they also confessed their faults to each other. Who does that? Why? Because intuitively, they knew, and I wish we did, is that when we're hiding part of our life, we become invisible in the world around us. Vulnerability is a kind of anti-invisibility cloak where we finally let ourselves be seen. And we're afraid of that. Because we still think that why people are attracted to us is because we get it right, because we're perfect. First of all, we're not perfect, and Jesus didn't come for perfect people. He came for people who were struggling. It's a vulnerability. It's astonishing. How many, the word courage actually used to mean, it originally meant to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. And the early church did that. Peter didn't hide that he failed three times. They acknowledged when they struggled or when they were intimidated or when they were afraid. They, they shared all that and they prayed for each other. When they opened their hearts, they didn't close the doors. And what I will tell you is that's real community. That's what we're built for. That's what our heart craves. And that's what God calls us to. So the second is sacrifice. He, he calls us to value sacrifice. Counterculture in our world, we, we don't want to sacrifice. We want to get the very best we can for the minimalist amount. Have you seen all the infomercials and commercials on television? This small piece of equipment possesses nearly magical powers, and it takes up almost no space, but it will turn you into a Greek god. You know, just make your body into something you always wanted it to be. And, and it costs almost nothing. And if it costs too much, it'll be simple, just only six small payments. That's all it is. Our world is all against the sacrifice. They, they, they don't see. When was the last time you saw a commercial? This is going to take everything you've got. <laughs> it's going to take it all. And I hope it works. So there's the toll-free number. No, nope, it's not even toll-free. You got to call. You got to pay to call in. It's, wow, it's amazing. Nobody does that. 
the concept of sacrifice, but the concept of sacrifice is exactly what Jesus teaches us and what that community embraced. Because if we identify our, our security as being in the things we possess or in the things that we have accomplished, then we're going to hold very tightly to those things. But if our security and our identity is what God has done for us and was doing through us, all of a sudden it allows us to release our grip on some of those things. And, and the Bible says that, that people who had possessions were willing to sell them to assist others who had need. Now, there are some people who read that passage of Scripture and they think that what this new community believed is that you didn't have the right to any personal property. That's not what it says. You can't sell, dispose of, and gift something you don't own. I could just walk out in the parking lot today and go, oh, there's a really nice car. I, th I think I'll sell it. <laughs> and then I'll give the money to someone I think deserves it. I can't do that. If it's not my car, I can't sell it. The Bible's not saying you don't own personal property or that's not appropriate. The Bible is saying that when you own something and you see the opportunity to make a difference, you get to make a decision. And if it's all about the stuff, you're not going to do much. But when you see the opportunities to make a difference, why are you able to do that? Well, partly because you value someone more than you value something. I mean, right? Don't we do this? Do you know what they never tell us? They never tell us how much it's going to cost to have children. <laughs> Do you know why they don't tell us? Because they haven't calculated it yet. It's not like they haven't tried. It's just that it keeps going. Like, we had children. I could go back and figure out how much it cost us, but it's not done yet because one of our children is having children, and that's costing us money, too. And if I live long enough and this thing keeps going on, I'm going to be broke. <laughs> and when you look into those little eyes, you don't care. You don't. Because this thing is not as important as this idea of sacrifice. It adds value. For our, our church is in an expansion project right now. We didn't ask anybody in our community for a dollar. We're not doing this so that we have a better place. We're doing this so that we have more space for people who didn't contribute anything to it to be able to come to it so they can experience the grace of God for themselves. We're willing to sacrifice what we have because we love them even more. We value what God can do in their lives. That's just how the process works. Right? Now, the last word, this is the worst one. This, this has become a swear word, though it has many more letters than four. It's become a swear word to a lot of people in the church or in our culture. So here it is. Ready? Tolerance. And, and some of you are going, yeah, I'm not writing that word down. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why this is hard for us. Because we've been listening to wolves who tell us that they're tired of having to be vulnerable at all. And that whether it's religious or secular society, if you want something, you have to take it by force. And so Jesus really, he upends this idea of tolerance. Some, by the way, you know, Jesus isn't just saying just tolerate everybody. Because how many here want to be tolerated? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's great. It's better than some things, but it's not what we, what we crave. Our, our culture's definition of tolerance, it sounds, well, let me, let me explain it to you. You tell me what it sounds like. Right now, the definition of tolerance in our culture says if you or a group that you're a part of believes that you own a truth and you're trying to convince other people to believe what you believe, you are an intolerant person. That you're not just accepting that other people can believe whatever they want to believe. You, you think you know something they don't know and you're trying to convince them. And that makes you intolerant. And in fact, not just intolerant, probably makes you dangerous. 
which is really intriguing to me because what they're saying is, if you don't believe what I believe, you're dangerous, which sounds a little intolerant to me. When Jesus talks about tolerance, he doesn't just say, you know, believe whatever you want to believe, or look at what he says in, in uh, Luke chapter 6. To you who are listening, I say, love your who? Yeah, see? I mean, it would have been hard enough if he just said, ignore your enemies. Pretend like they're not there. He doesn't. Then he goes on to, to do more. Do good to those who hate you. He's not done. Bless those who curse you. I mean, when was the last time you were driving down the road and, and somebody cut you off and, and, and they're screaming vulgarities out the window and you rolled your window down and you yelled back to them, Grace to you! <laughs> Just don't do that. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. It's relatively easy to go along with people who share your views. Our culture basically says that if you have a view in which you're trying to convince anyone else of anything else, you're an intolerant person. And that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says basically no one is going to accept what you believe. And in fact, they might be offended by it and even try to have some measure of retaliation. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to pray for, not pray about. These are not prayers of vengeance. God, you see that person. You heard what they said. Let them choke on their dinner tonight. <laughs> just... Just... That's, that's, that's not a, a good prayer. It might have been heartfelt. But that's not the same thing. <laughs> to actually do good. I'll come back to that in just a second. So pray for them. Do good for them. Why does he say this? This, this is a really interesting thing to me. Because he gives us an internal thing to do before we respond to an external thing. What he's saying is, once you have processed, once you've learned to love, and love isn't a feeling of affection, that's how we've watered that down to be, but it's a commitment for the best of someone else. And, and, and once you love someone, and once you've been willing to pray for them and to do good to, for them, then what you're able to do is to respond in a way that's actually for them, not just retaliating because they did something against you. One of the biggest knocks on Christianity is that it just appeases evil in the world. It allows injustice to flow like a river until the whole world becomes this swamp of stuff that nobody wants anymore. While, while bad stuff is happening, Christians just stand by. I mean, it says it right there, doesn't it? Like, if they slap you on your cheek, you just give them the other cheek. So how is that going to fix anything? And that's because we don't understand. We live in a culture that's actually quite different from that culture. I've been in the Middle East. I've been in places in the world where this is very common, where when people go up to... By the way, it's common among celebrities in our own culture. People go up to each other, and as they approach, they turn their cheek for a, a kiss. And what they're saying is, I'm willing to acknowledge to you and to the people who are watching this right now, I have some level of relationship with you. I will not cut you out of my life. And what Jesus is saying is, if they slap you on the cheek, you don't go, well, you don't just withdraw. You're not going to get me again. What he's saying is, you're, you're letting them know. Even that action doesn't disqualify you from being able to be in a relationship with me because I want what's best for you. And this is what's absolutely fascinating. Once you love them, meaning you want what's best for them, and you've prayed for them, and you're open to that relationship, now when you speak to them, you can actually confront them in the right way for the right reason. You're not just angry because they caused you pain. You want what's best for them. If they keep treating people like this, they're going to destroy themselves and the people they love, and you want better for them. And that conversation, when you have it with people, has a huge influence. 
It's absolutely amazing how powerful that can be. That's the tolerance that Jesus calls us to. Deeper community helps us have better responses to those outside of the community. That once we discover our security and our identity is in Christ, once we discover that we can be vulnerable with each other, where we can sacrifice for each other, we can be tolerant of each other, once we discover that in our community, it enables us to go out and, and be incredibly bold witnesses for Christ because what can they take from us? They didn't give it to us. We have what our world craves. And it was given to us as a gift by God. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, uh, these values that you showed in your son and that you teach us, these are very countercultural. Um, we would far rather be invulnerable than vulnerable. And we would far rather receive than sacrifice and, uh, and yet, you showed us in the life of your son, like he, was, he was all of those things. He had the capacity of, of stopping every action against him, and he didn't do it. He was vulnerable. And he, he sacrificed to the point of giving his own life. And he wanted what was best, even for those who were trying to harm him. Even in dying words, he was able to gasp out, Father, forgive them. And for the communities that value those things, they, they experience a life and a depth that we're created for. Would you help us trust you in these things, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together this morning.